to begin this morning with some brand new details in the Idaho college student murders. Accused killer Brian Koberger is a statistical match to DNA recovered from the knife sheath found at the crime scene. Now that is according to some newly released court documents. A protective order was filed last week that expands on the initial probable cause affidavit. Now we already knew that Koberger's father was linked to the knife sheath. The FBI further compared DNA from the sheath to a cheek swab of the defendant and confirmed that it was a match. Now these revelations come from a protective order filed by the state seeking to protect the identities of Brian Koberger's extended family. Many have said that DNA is what will convict the killer. The Gonsalves family attorney Shannon Gray previously spoke to Court TV about the importance of the knife sheath to this case. Take a look. That was a pretty lengthy probable cause affidavit. It's one of the lengthiest ones I've ever seen. Um, uh, but I think they were very, you know, they wanted to provide as much information as they could uh, to establish probable cause in it. It laid out a little bit of the state's case, how they might proceed on the case at trial. Um, but there's a lot of still other circumstantial evidence that uh, will be gathered between now and the trial date. You know, you still have three other crime scenes. You have his apartment, you have the car, you have uh, his parents' house that all need to be processed for evidence um, of the crime. And then any other evidence that comes in between now and then. Um, but the probable cause, I mean, I, I thought that, you know, it was it was well done. Um, you know, the, I think the biggest piece of evidence that jumps out to you is the DNA evidence on the sheet. I think that's the that's the the one piece of evidence that will be hard to explain uh, as a defense attorney on the case. So I think that's the the biggest piece of evidence. Now I want to talk a little bit more about this, and I I have a prop, uh, and I can't underscore enough just how heavy this is. I have a K bar knife here. Uh, this is the type of weapon that was used to kill those four beautiful college students. Um, this is the sheath, and it was on this snap of the sheath. This snap right here that was swabbed, and that's where that little bit of a DNA profile began. So that's where it all started. Now, investigators didn't know whose DNA it was on the snap. They just were able to get somebody's DNA here. And as they continued investigating, they honed in on Brian Koberger. That is why investigators started going through the trash at the family home. And in going through the trash, they were able to get something to compare to that profile from the snap, right? And in doing that, they knew it was the son of Papa Koberger, right? That's what they knew from this. It was the, the offspring of Papa Koberger was found right here on this little teeny tiny snap of this knife sheath left behind. The knife was not. I'm gonna show you how big the knife is too. Wait till I pull this out and you see this. This is so heavy. I mean, look at this. Look how large this is. Uh, this turns my stomach. And this isn't the first time I've held this. I've held this previously in our newsroom. It's very heavy. Uh, the handle's very heavy. Uh, when you think about this being the murder weapon used, uh, it turns your stomach the sheer brutality of these homicides, each of those young people being stabbed multiple times with this K-bar knife. And I'm gonna put it back in the sheath here as I continue talking um, and button up that snap. So once they knew it was Papa Koberger's uh, sons or offsprings DNA on this, uh, that was a really great starting point. And that was in the original uh, affidavit that we all read and we're looking at. Um, police were able to take it a step further. Uh, there was a court order and, and Brian uh, Koberger had a, a what's called a buckle swab taken. If you hear that, it's a cheek swab. They stick what looks like a Q-tip into the cheek, swab it around, and they're able to take that. Once he was arrested, they're able to do that per court order. And they did DNA test number two. And this is why this is so important. Um, with test number two, they were able to confirm Koberger's DNA with what was on this snap, and then be able to come to the conclusion that yes, it's Brian Koberger's DNA that's on that knife sheath that was left behind at the crime scene. This is huge. 
Let's talk more about this. I have two excellent attorneys on the program with me this morning in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Criminal defense attorney and former prosecuting attorney, Sue Ian Robinson. And in East Lansing, Michigan, trial attorney, Jamie White. Wonderful to see you both. Thanks so much for coming on the program today. Uh, for any doubters out there who were saying, oh, I don't know about this DNA, I don't know if it's Brian Koberger's, I don't understand this, the offspring of, of dad, uh, this second DNA test seems to uh, put to bed all of those doubts, uh, does it not? Uh, Sue Ann Robinson, I want to go to you first, please. Weigh in and tell us your thoughts on this new development, please. I think this is a very important development because obviously it places him at the scene and it places his DNA on the sheath, which is arguably to be where the murder weapon was held. And so I think the most important thing for the state to show is that the initial DNA test is part of the steps in that process. Part of the process is initially testing the DNA, then doing the comparison as you discussed with the buckle swab from his cheek. And then once that was compared, then that's how they came to the conclusion that Brian Kohlberger was the, the person whose DNA was found. But I think it's gonna be important for the prosecution to explain those steps to the jury. I think that the jury is always hungry and for DNA evidence, for scientific evidence, for evidence that they can look to to say, this isn't testimony, this isn't um, something that we're speculating on, this is not something that we're having to apply our you know, common sense to necessarily, this is a hard concrete fact. Right, right, Sue Ann, well said. Uh, and it makes sense when you think about it because police get the profile initially from the snap and then they go to the house where Koberger is. He's their guy. They like him for these homicides. So they start digging through the trash. Well, that trash is shared. It's shared between dad, mom, and Koberger. So uh, they're getting something from that trash, not sure who it belongs to, somebody in the family. It makes sense that they would be able to say, ah, offspring of dad, that's whose DNA this is, and then confirm it by the cheek swab, the buckle swab with Koberger once he was uh, locked up and charged and then say, okay, yeah, for sure, that's what was left behind. Um, I'm going to pull this giant knife out. I mean, this is, it's just, it is so heavy to hold. I can't imagine a homicide being committed with this knife, holding this knife. I mean, this is, it's just incredible to me. Uh, and those poor young people uh, stabbed to death. This left behind why was this left behind? I want to go back to the affidavit. It says, quote, the knife sheath was found on a bed next to the bodies of Madison and Kaylee. Remember, these were the roommates. They, they uh, were sharing the bed together that night. Uh, best of friends. The sheath was found face down, partially under both Madison's body and the comforter on the bed. Why was this left? This is a big thing to leave behind. Look how huge this is. Uh, attorney Jamie White, let me go to you on this one. This is one of those stunning things. Somebody goes to do four homicides and they leave behind this uh, with DNA. Um, do you think that's gonna be a tough fact for prosecutors or perhaps a helpful fact because we know we got the DNA on this? Yeah, so uh, I think that you know what we're gonna hear from the defense is that they're going to concede the DNA evidence. I agree with Sue Ann that there's going to be some challenges to the testing processes. We see this all the time, but the evidence is overwhelming. And, you know, the science is so good now that even if it is a relative, it's very easy to distinguish who the actual contributor was. As far as the defense is concerned, you know, their only reasonable logical play at this point is to concede that the DNA was on the sheath, but in, in some fashion, it came into the possession of some other individual. I don't believe that's a reasonable or rational um, you know, explanation, but I think that's the only place they can go. As far as why the sheath is there, you know, the thing that troubled me about this case early on, Julie, was four people um, murdered without, it appears to be without much of a, a defense put up by anybody. And then there's a lot of reasons for that, but at the end of the day, you have to believe that somebody did something um, out of out of fear and 
ultimately led Mr. Kohlberger to leave that sheaf behind um, because to your point, you know, no reasonable person would do that, um, you know, in, in light of the fact that this was clearly a planned out home invasion, homicide and, and other potential crimes. Right, Jamie. Uh, take it a step further. I keep thinking about this guy that we know was wearing gloves when he's back in PA, wearing gloves when he's touching his own trash. Uh, I guess the joke's on you, Brian Koberger, because they uh, Koberger, because they got your DNA uh, and matched it to this knife at the crime scene. But I mean, he was being so careful wearing the gloves around, but leaving this behind. Um, this is just, it's one of those things I wonder, Sue Ann, uh, was this guy so cocky that he might have done this on purpose, thinking I'll never get caught. Everybody says he was arrogant. He thought he knew it all. He was that kid in class. I'm sure you and Jamie had that person in class in your law school class who would think they knew the answers better than everybody, think they were smarter than everybody. Uh, they said that was this guy. And if he did do what police say he did and plotted this out and methodically was stalking these people and, and, and following them and going to the house and, and, and had made 12 previous trips to the house, uh, you think think he'd be more careful. Uh, Sue Ann, last word here, please. Yeah, I think there's always the theory and there's always the plan. And then there's actually in the heat of the moment when it's happening. To me, him leaving behind the sheath or the idea that he left it behind shows that obviously, as Jamie said, there was a moment where there was a chaotic scene where it wasn't probably going according to the way he planned and he lost track of the sheath. That's what it de would demonstrate to me. If I was a juror, I would say there was obviously something, a moment or a span of time where there was a chaotic issue that took him off of his plan or caused him to leave it behind because things weren't going according to how he probably planned them out. Mm -hmm. Right, Sue Ann, right. You know, and, and I wonder also if, if he wore gloves, uh, when he allegedly committed these homicides, you know, police say he murdered these four people. I wonder if he had gloves on at the time, uh, because the only place on this on this little tiny snap, which makes me wonder, um, you know, the way in which this was handled prior to uh, it going to that home that night, and. I, I just, I have so many questions still, uh, but this is a big piece of information coming out today with uh, investigators doing that second test to confirm that it is in fact the DNA of Brian Koberger found on the snap on the knife sheath. It looks just like this K-Bar knife I've got in my hands.